everybody. We are so ready. It's going to be awesome. We love them. All right, so today we are going to dive into the part of the Red Letter Challenge, which is on generosity, on giving. And we're not going to be talking about tithing. Tell your neighbor, this is not about tithing. Because usually when pastors go into that, they'll be like, oh, this is about tithing. No, it's not about the discipline of, of, of tithing. It's about the heart of generosity and what that does. So today, I want us to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And we're going to read the first part of this story, the first Bible verses. We'll, we'll have it on screen. And, uh, and then we'll dive into this story. All right? It says this. Then King David said to the whole assembly, My son Solomon, the one whom God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. The task is great because this palatial structure is not for man but for the Lord. With all my resources I have provided for the temple of God, gold for the gold work, silver for the silver, bronze for the bronze, iron for the iron, and wood for the wood as well as oxen for the, uh, onyx, not oxen, <laughs> onyx for the setting, we'll get to the ox, oxes too, <laughs> onyx for the settings, turquoise, stones of various colors, and all kinds of fine stone and marble, all of these in large quantities. Besides, in my devotion to the temple of God, I now give my personal treasure of gold and silver for the temple of God. Over and above everything I have provided for his holy temple. 3,000 talents of gold, gold and offer. And 7,000 talents of refined silver for the overlaying of the walls of the buildings. For the gold work and the silver work. And for all the work to be done by the craftsmen. Now, who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? Then the leaders of the families, the officers of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, and the officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. They gave to work toward the work on the temple of God, 5,000 talents and 10,000 uh, dariks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. Anyone who had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the temple of the Lord in the custody of Jael the Hershonite. Her Hershonite? Yep. The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. Let's go to verse uh, number 17, and we'll finish with this one. David said, I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. Uh, I want you to invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads and let's prepare our hearts for the word today. Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you so much because you are here. We thank you because you are constantly speaking to us. And we thank you because there is purpose in us sitting here today. There is something that we need to hear. There is something that we need to do. There is something that today will bring purpose to our lives, Lord, in your word and in your name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Today's message is called Blueprint. It's called Blueprint. And I don't know if you know this, but we are the biggest small church in San Diego. All right? That's what we are. The biggest small church in San Diego. And we are here to build a church. That's what we're doing here. This is the season where, which we find ourselves in. We are building up a church. So the person that is sitting next to you is not only somebody that attends, it's somebody that is building. So tell your neighbor, thank you for building. Thank you. for. And if their name is Bob... Then they're Bob the Builder. And we need a Bob the Builder here. <laughs> All right, I just, I digress. <laughs> and so we are building something here. And the Bible teaches us the heart behind the build. And the heart behind the build is generosity. That's how it is. Now, let's go to Old Testament times. This is, this is before Jesus. And we had these big empires and kingdoms. The way things were built is they were forced onto people. They were forced onto people. 
the, the rulers of that time, when they conquered a town or a city or a place, what they would do is because they conquered them, they were forced to, on the people to give everything they owed or, or they, they had, right? They, they would take even people. They would take even the sons to go work and all this. We see this in Egypt. We see this in, in various cultures where it was, it was something to, it was forced upon them. It was slave labor, right? It was all of these things that it was forced upon them. When, when David took the throne and he, was, he wanted to do things God's way and he wanted to understand the plan be, uh, behind what God wanted to do, especially for his temple, especially for the place of worship, especially for where God's presence was going to be, God told him, hey, you will not force this on anybody. You can't force this on anybody because we're doing things different. Not only will you not force this on anybody, only the people that have had this in their hearts genuinely will be invited to participate. And so David, who is described in the Bible like a man after God's own heart, he said, it has to start with me. And so the story of the temple starts with David, not only as the administrator of the riches and of the wealth of his kingdom, but of his personal wealth. It starts by saying, look, this is what we have at our disposal. This is how we're going to budget as a nation for the temple of God. But also, let me talk to, the, to, to my people and say, before anyone, let me tell you what I'm going to give. Let me show you my heart. Let me, let me show you what God has placed in my heart, the passion that I have for building the temple, the, the excitement that I have, how this is genuine. Let me start with myself. As far as I know, this is the first time in recorded history where a monarch uses his own money <laughs> to build something he's passionate about. Usually it's the other way around, right? If he gets passionate about something, he uses somebody else's money, right? He just goes after and says, oh, I want to build this beautiful castle and so everybody give because that's what I want. But in the Bible, we see that God touches David's heart. He understands what's going on. And he starts first. In this story, in the first part of the story, we see that in verse, uh, verse 1, it mentions that he's saying that this is something that his son Solomon has to do, but he is young and inexperienced. In other words, he's like one church. Because we are young and inexperienced. Just tell your neighbor, amen, amen. <laughs> But God has chosen us. That's awesome. Yes, we're young. Yes, we're... Can I tell you King David knew about being young and inexperienced? When he was chosen by God, he was the least wanted of his family. He was young. He didn't know anything about war. He was completely inexperienced. And yet God chose him. This is something that should start burning a fire in our hearts and saying, Yeah, we are the smallest big church. In, or the biggest small church. That's how small and inexperienced we are. <laughs> yes, we are, but let me tell you what. God has chosen us for here. We were chosen to do this. And he brought us from different parts of, you know, of our, in different seasons of our lives, in different forms. But we are here and God has chosen us. And so when we see that, that, we have to start understanding that God is laying a foundation when he chooses us. You're, ne you're sitting next to somebody God chose right now. That's how important this is. We are chosen. We are chosen. And then it goes on to say, the task is great. Uh, in another version, it says the task is huge. It's huge. This task is a, is a very big task. It's a very big thing. And so the first point that I want to touch on is building a church should be a huge task. It should be a huge project. It should be an amazing, great undertaking. For us that, are, is, that we are young and inexperienced, for us to take on this task is huge. We're only about a year old as a church. We were meeting at the movie theater just a few months ago before pandemic and COVID hit and all this. And then this door opens up. And when I was talking to some of our mentors and just people that advise me and, and, and that help us out with the church that have more experience... And we told them about taking over this building and, and the plans that we have for it and everything. They're like, David, that is a huge project. 
That's pretty big. I mean, how many of you guys are attending? And I said, uh, uh, like 1,200 by faith. <laughs> Not by sight, but by faith. <laughs> I'm praying. I, I see you. <laughs> and they're like, that's a huge undertaking. That's a huge undertaking. It's a huge project. But the Bible teaches us that this is how God does things. Now, remember, today we are talking about generosity. There is something important in our faith when it comes to generosity. Generosity is a big part of our faith. Uh, it's not something, and I want to dive into other things, but it's not something that is man-created. It's not a man strategy that we did it oh this sounds great to be part of what we do this is in the bible this is how everything starts this is like this is how the first temple of god started with a foundation on generosity with with a call out for generosity this is huge so this project that we have absolutely is a god's project why because it's a huge task and and we understand that god is behind what is going on here? If we continue reading the story in verse 9, I'm sorry, in verse 5, it says this. How many of you are willing to set yourselves apart to the Lord today? To set yourself apart. It's using the same root word as sanctification. When we talk about in Christianity of saints, right, or, or being sanctified, we, we, it, depending on where we come from, we think of, oh, this is a holy man, and if, I, if I'm close to this holy man, then I, I get a certain blessing, or I can play a, pray a blessing. But the Bible, sanctification literally means just set apart. Set apart, meaning that once we accept Jesus in our hearts, then we are not of this world, we are set apart. We are something that is now uh, inside of God. We are now set apart and our lives start reflecting that little by little. That's our faith journey. Uh, our faith journey is to reflect as much as we can how set apart we are from the things of this world. If the world does things this way, we'll do it, we're going to do it the opposite wi way. Why? Because we're set apart. If the, if, if the temple and the, then the castles were built this way in history, then the temple of God is going to be built the opposite way. Why? Because we're set apart. So what the Bible is teaching us here uh, is something very profound, is that giving to the church, having generosity, giving to the church is part of our sanctification. It's part of our journey in sanctification. It puts things in order. The, the, the benefits of, of living a sanctified life, of living a godly life uh, in, in our faith journey every day is that it, it starts bringing things into the right order. It starts uh, addressing things in our lives and it starts uh, uh, fixing things in our lives that before couldn't be fixed. There are certain areas in our lives as humans that we always struggle with. And until we can give those areas to God, we will always continue to struggle. Finances is one of them. Amen? I struggle with finances. Absolutely, I struggle with finances. Every time, my wife struggles with finances. <laughs> That's another thing. She's here today, not with kids, so I'll stop right there. We all struggle with finances, but... Every single time we give to God, every single time we give to build the church, then our lives get closer to God, and because of that, our lives become sanctified. We have to understand that there's a plan, there's a purpose be behind giving. It's not only a physical purpose that we see in a building, but there's a spiritual purpose in it as well. There's a spiritual purpose behind giving, behind the build, behind this blueprint that God has for our lives. If we continue on to verse 9, it says this. The people were happy when they saw what their leaders had been willing to give. The people were happy, the community was happy when they saw the example that their leaders were giving. Now, every one of us in one way, shape, or form are in a leadership role, are in an influential role. For instance, I am a, a dad and when and, and I have that leadership role on my kids. I'm also a pastor here that serves, and I have that leadership role here. And we can go on, and everyone has that role. But 
what the Bible is teaching us is that there's, there, something happens when we lead by example here at church. When we lead by example. When, we, when we're passionate about things. When we are wholeheartedly, we're doing things. And so our testimony, this is point number three, our testimony of generosity brings joy and hope to our community. Our testimony of generosity. Never underestimate the power of a gift. Never underestimate the power of the gift. Um, all our Sunday services, everything we do here, we do it for free. 100% for free for our community. Anybody that walks in can be blessed and can you know, receive everything because this is our gift to the community. This is what we do to the community. The events that we do. Never underestimate the power of the gift. A gift is so powerful that God used it to save humanity. Because the Bible teaches us that God gave His only Son. That was a gift for humanity. That was God's strategy for salvation. So never underestimate the power of a gift. Never underestimate the power. Can you think of something that somebody had given you and, and you're like, wow, that, that I'll never forget that gift. You know, I'll never forget that, that just that, the way it was given to me, the moment it was given to me. So never underestimate the power of a gift. What we do here as a church for our community is a gift that we receive from God and that now we pay it forward. That now we give it to them. And this, the purpose for this is to bring joy and hope to our community. Uh, we, we went this last week on a trip and we went to a place in Mexico called uh, San Miguel de Allende, St. Mike of Allende. San Miguel, that's what it means, St. Mike, St. Michael. St. Mike is okay. I think it's cool. <laughs> and, and we went there, and, you know, they're going through the struggles as well with COVID and the pandemic, and we see everyone and, and, and where they're at. And now, if, if pandemic, if you think that it hit us very hard here in the States, in third world countries, it hit extra hard. I'm talking about ex we it was it had been a while since I've seen like the children just there in in the corners you know like uh, uh in the streets and like sleeping right there and people trying to sell you something while their whole family is there just so they can eat you know th that sort of thing and so it hit really hard and as we're 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 hearing these conversations and I was there I was attuned to uh hearing about how people are just wanting to hear some good news. Just something. Just give me, I don't care if it's changed the tear from red to purple to bruised. I don't know what color that is, but just give me some good news. Just they're, they're, they're waiting for some good news. It's been so hard, so difficult. We hear so many bad things around us that people are just longing for just something good. This is something that the soul needs. It's not something that Dr. Fauci can do anything about right or the medical or the scientific community they can't they cannot address the soul and the soul is hurting of people the soul is hurting even more than our physical bodies we see it in kids wanting to go back to school and feeling disconnected and all this the soul is hurting we see this in couples. We see this in families that are apart, right, that, that are separated. And when somebody gets sick, they're like, oh, my goodness, I'm so far. What is going on? The soul is hurting. And people are longing for good news, are longing for good news. Let me tell you something. Since biblical times, nothing has changed. That's why the gospel is called the good news. The good news in this part of Chronicles, what we're reading right now, uh, the, the God's people needed good news. They needed something good. They needed to be part of something positive, of something good. Not COVID, not COVID positive, like something positive in life, right? <laughs> but they wanted to be part of something good, part of something positive. And when God said, hey, let's build my house, let's build the temple, this is going to be something good, something changed in their hearts. Because now they were doing something good. Now they were part of something bigger than themselves. Something that was bringing joy and hope to their community around them. This is what God's house does. It brings joy and hope. 
And even if it's a little Easter egg hunt, guess what that does? It brings joy and it brings hope. Even if it's celebrating Easter with big fancy hats and having to spend something. (laughs) It brings joy and hope. And that's why we're here. And this year we need to bring joy and hope. Amen? Amen. And that's what we're going to do. There's a calling, there's a purpose behind everything. It's not just something we do now. As a, as a small church and as a growing church, and, and this month, and we're going to have a, a growth track and open the doors for people to volunteer. When you volunteer, there's a purpose behind it. There's so much more. It's not just helping out the church. It's not just, oh, I can greet at the door, or, or I can play in the worship team, or I can do, I can help with the kids, or I can have a small, there's so much more to that. God uses our talents, our time to bring people hope and joy. It really does. When we can play an instrument, we do here, not only are we worshiping, and not only are we doing something that we're called to do as a church, to focus on God, to worship God, but the people that play up here, the people that bring their talents here, don't they bring us joy and hope too? It does something. We're going to, ha- all the people that have been working at the cafe and doing something there, when we walk in and now it's working and it's coming up, doesn't that bring joy and hope to us? The people in kids, every single area, even when we greet people, we don't have greeters yet, but we're working on them. But once we have the team set up and, and do that, not only are we growing spiritually, are we doing our part in church, are we putting our time into it, but it does something to our community. It connects us to our community. And so that's why every single time that we do what we are called to do, God uses it to bring joy and hope to our community. That's why, you know, I, I, I love being here all the time. And I, I was joking about this, but I told people this Sunday, this morning, I said, I think, I think you might, you might have missed me as much as I missed you guys last Sunday. And even though I was doing what I had to do and everything, there is a connection here. And when I come here, it brings me joy and hope. It brings me joy and hope to be part of the house of God. Amen? Amen. Tell your neighbor, that was beautiful. That was just beautiful. (laughs) But we're talking about generosity. We're talking about God's plan, God's blueprint. Generosity, it it sounds really nice, it sounds beautiful, but it's tough. And God knows this. And you know what? I I love this verse because it, it... In the Bible, you know, when you read so many tons of gold and silver and all this, I'm like, that's awesome because in California, it costs the same to build a church. You know, it's almost like the same. You have to bring the jewels and the gold and the silver. It costs the same. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. I can identify. I can relate, you know, with that. But it's tough to be generous. It's really tough to be generous. And I I, I wanted to, to know if God understood how tough it is for us. To be generous. Because God is God. He can be generous. Right? He gave, he gave his son. I mean, he gave everything. He gave the throne. He gave everything to be with us. But God is God. But I wanted to see if in a practical way God understood what generosity does to humans. How it challenges us. How, how we have times where we can be really generous because it's good times. And how we have times where we just can't. Yes? Are we being real today? Okay. That's good. That's good. We're being real. I like it. And then comes verse 17. Everybody say, oh, verse 17. Oh, verse 17. It says this. David says, my God, I know that you what? Test. That you test our hearts. Oh, 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 oh. So there's an other purpose to generosity. You see, generosity is a test. Generosity is a test. Giving is a test of honesty. Uh Uh-oh, here we go. Let's dive into this one. Let's go into this. Generosity tests, tests our honesty. Look, Look at what verse 17 continues saying. It says, and you are pleased when we are honest. That's what it says. Generosity is a test. Generosity Uh, uh, tests our faith. Is our faith real? How real am I being with God right now? Generosity can can gauge that. 
How close am I to, to believing in God in any situation? Generosity tests that too. Um, how, how strong are we as a church? How committed are we to this community? Oh, oh generosity will test that too. Because God enjoys honesty. He delights in honesty. He wants our belief to be an honest belief. He wants our faith to be an honest faith. When we are coming to church, we go through several phases as Christians, as, as followers of Jesus. And, and one of them, usually when we come to church, is we're really looking for an answer. We're looking for an alternative. We're looking for help from a, a situation. Every single person that is here, that's how we got to church. We're looking for, how can I deal with this situation? Let me try church, right? I've tried something else. We come. That is beautiful, and that's what church is all about. Remember, our purpose is to bring hope and joy. That's, that's what Jesus taught. And so that's great. Once we're here and we're starting to interact with, with God in our lives, and we start to interact with the Bible, and we start to interact with church and what goes on here, then something starts happening when we start seeing Jesus in our own lives and our soul, our life, our heart, now God wants to test it. Because when God tests it, then God can grab a hold of it. Let me say that one more time. When God tests it, then God can grab a hold of it. Usually we run from tests, but let me tell you what, King David knew about tests too. He was tested all the time. And he understood that in that test, when, when, when it wasn't him holding on to God, it was God holding on to him now. Every time he was being tested, God holds his heart and says, I know I'm asking a lot of you, but I got you now. Because this is my test. This is my request now. I, I, I'm, I'm calling you to do this. And generosity tests our heart. But also generosity allows God to hold on to our lives. To hold on to our lives. It is awesome to live a life where we hold on to God. It's even better to live a life when God is holding on to us. And generosity is a test is a test. It's not, it's not so much uh, how much we can give, and that's why I don't want to talk today about tithing or the amounts and all this. I want to talk to you about the blueprint, the plans behind how God builds His church. And today, every single one of us, I want us to, to understand that what the purpose behind generosity, the purpose behind God requesting this, God asking this of David. He even says several times, hey, this is huge because we're not building something for man. This is for God. If you read the whole chapter, you see these, these other things that, that David picks up on. And, and I don't have a lot of time, but... Uh, I want to end on this one, but it's something God's saying, I know you've lived a life where you want to hold on to me. I want to test you because if you accept this test, you're going to live a life where I'm holding on to you, where I have you in my hands, where I understand, I understand that this task is huge. I understand that this task is something that is, is scary sometimes, that is too committed, you know, that uh, you, it, it's something that can become overwhelming. And look at how this ends. And uh, we're going to end with this. And then we're going to have a time of worship. We're going to have a time where we can just come to God's presence and really uh, tell God, wow, you're doing this in my heart of being generous. You're doing this in my heart of understanding that you want to hold on to my heart. Verse 17 ends like this. It says, I'll read the whole thing. My God, I know that you tested our hearts and you are pleased when we are honest. I've given all these things just because I wanted to. When I did it, I was completely honest with you. Your people here have also been willing to give to you. And I've been happy to see this. In church, in church. Every time we go and read something in the Bible, every time we read something, right afterwards, we have to have an honest moment with God. An honest moment with God. It pleases God when we're honest. Now today, 
you might be feeling that challenge in your heart of generosity. You might, be, uh, you might have already been feeling this, this challenge of generosity. And sometimes we were in a position that we could have given a lot more. Be honest with God. And sometimes we're in a position where I can't give anymore, God. Be honest with God. The key here is honesty. It's not quantity. God is not an accountant. God is a father. He wants you to have an honest conversation with him as a father. Because God has you in his hands. He has you. And if we can have that honest moment with him, then he will take care of what we can't take care of. When, when he sees us as young and inexperienced, we need to, uh, not all, only as a church are we clinging on to God, right? But we need to have these honest moments because we need to understand and remind ourselves that when we're honest, when we're generous, God has us 